Let's talk about these riots in Baltimore for a minute. These all began. And to say they began with the death of Freddie Gray is really not a correct statement. Freddie Gray was a young guy in his mid to late 20s. I think he was 26 or 27. I don't remember exactly. But Freddie Gray was a black man living in Baltimore. And apparently he was in a neighborhood where there was a lot, there was known to be a lot of drug activity. And by the officer's own statements, they were out there conducting some sort of operation and they looked at Freddie and Freddie made eye contact with them. This is, the, this is what the police have stated. The police made eye contact with Freddie. Freddie looked back and made eye contact with them, and then he and a friend turned and ran. The police officers then pursued Freddie and his friend based off of the fact that they had made eye contact and then he had ran away. And when they captured him, they put him in cuffs, they searched him, they found a switchblade knife in his pocket, they then put him into the back of a paddy wagon, Paddy wagon, of course, in reference to uh, a large van where they they haul multiple people away. Um, you might hear it called the drunk the drunk the drunk van as well, or something like that. Because when you have large groups of people at the bars who get arrested for fighting or something, and you're going to haul them all in, you bring this big paddy wagon over and you shove them all in there. And I can call it a paddy wagon because I'm Irish, and uh, so screw you guys who want to talk to me like I'm a racist. But what's funny is no one would ever call me a racist for calling it a paddy wagon. It's like, oh, it's the Irish. Screw them. <laughs> but anyway, so they, they put him in the paddy wagon, and they take him on what it, they said it was around a 30-minute trip, at which point somehow his spinal cord was severed more than 80% at the neck. And he was then taken to the hospital where a little more than a week later he died. Now, it has been 10 days since that man's death. And no one has said anything about how it happened or why it happened. Guy, they have images, a, a film of him being arrested, of him being, after he'd been tased and being picked up and put into the paddy wagon, into the van, and being driven off, and he was completely sane, he was of sound mind, he did not appear to be injured other than just being angry and the fact that he'd been tased. And he puts, gets put into the back of the wagon and taken off, and then all of a sudden, between there, when he got into the van, and when they, uh, before they got to the destination, he ends up having his spinal cord virtually severed at the neck. Now, the police department has been paying out an exorbitant amount of money recently for uh, police brutality cases, where the police have acted far beyond what is necessary and appropriate in use of force. And there is another case in which these particular officers, not necessarily the ones in the van, but the Baltimore police, have been putting people into the backs of these vans and not putting their seatbelts on and then taking them for little joy rides. You know, some little quick turns and quick stops. And since you're handcuffed and you don't have any seatbelt on, you can imagine what would happen. Your inability to protect yourself and your face and your body with your hands tied behind your or strapped behind your back or in front of you um, and the difficulty in that. And so there is a history of the Baltimore Police Department acting in a manner not befitting their role in the community. And so patiently, the, the, the family of Freddie Gray called for calm. They said, we're waiting to hear. We want to know what happened. We want to let justice work. But unfortunately, justice didn't work. Ten days went by. Freddie's body is now in the ground. He's been dead and buried. They've had his funeral. Toxolo to toxicology reports came back. Freddie had no drugs on him. He was physically all right when they put him in the back of the van and the city the police department has refused to bring any charges has refused to uh, explain to the family what happened or provide any evidence of all as to how the injury occurred or what caused the death or who might be responsible because i can assure you freddie's not responsible for severing his own spinal cord and it happened while he was in police custody and so finally now that it's been 10 days and Freddie has been buried, you are starting to see riots 
happened in the city. And it didn't start out as riots. It started out as protests. And now this is what we have. Cue up clip one, Darren. This is the mayor last night talking about what was happening around the city. Or sorry, the governor. This evening, as a result of the serious violence and looting, which has led to the destruction of property and put innocent Marylanders at significant risk, I have declared a state of emergency at the request of Baltimore City. This order deploys the Maryland National Guard uh, in order to help restore order and to end uh, the unrest that we witnessed today and tonight. I have not made this decision lightly. The National Guard represents a last resort in order to restore order. Look, people have the right to pro protest and express their frustration, but Baltimore City families deserve peace and safety in their communities. And these acts of violence and destruction of property cannot and will not be tolerated. Now, I would, I would add to that. Um, I would agree that we're going to talk about the, the rioting and the protesting and, and, and that stuff here in a minute. But I would add to what the governor said that the people of Baltimore have a right to know what their police department did and how the police department is culpable in the death of a man who obviously died in their custody in a violent way. And yet there's no discussion of that. Now, let me, let me back up for a minute and take this from the beginning. First of all, I, I want to know, Darren, is making eye contact with the police a, a, an arrestable offense? No. Is running from the police an arrestable offense? Running alone? No. Okay. Uh, on, on itself, just running away. You see police, you run away. Is that something that the police have the right to chase you down and take you off to jail for? No. No. Okay. Now, in the totality, because one of the things that, that a judge will look at is the totality of circumstances. So he will take a look at everything the officer was in, was in, had encountered at the time. And while all of the individual pieces may not, by themselves, may not justify arrest, in the, the to totality of circumstances oftentimes will justify stopping a person, questioning them, giving you probable cause. So I will ask you this, is making contact with an officer and then running away probable cause to arrest and search them? No. No, it's not. No. So on its face, Freddie Gray was stopped and searched and the officer had no probable cause to do it. You want to talk about walking while black? Arrested because you're black? Hey, he just happened to be in a bad neighborhood of town, which he can't help, and he was black. And he made contact with an officer, and then he decided to run away. And the cops, are, and the cops grabbed him. Now, he did have a switchblade knife on him. So once the cops searched him, and it was funny because I was listening last night to, uh, this is how bad the reporting is. I was listening to Megyn Kelly. And she said he had a switchblade knife on him, and there's, there's nothing necessarily illegal about having a switchblade knife on you. And I said, nah, I don't think that's true, because in most municipalities, any spring-loaded knife is considered to be illegal. And so I looked it up. I mean, it took me all of three minutes uh, to deduce whether or not they had an arrestable offense there. And in fact, they did. It, it, you can, uh, having a, a spring-loaded knife in Baltimore, you are subject to at a, a $500 fine or up to one year in, in prison because you, uh, or one year in jail, I guess, uh, for having a weapon like that on you. So certainly once they found the knife, they had reason to arrest him. But the question is, is did they have the right or, or reasonable suspicion or probable cause to search him in the first place? And the answer is no. So the arrest in and of itself would have probably been thrown out of court once they got up there, because simply having someone make eye contact with you and run away is not justification to stop them and search them. You're free to run away from the cops in America as long as you're doing nothing wrong. And in this case, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was standing on a street corner. So originally, the, the arrest itself was a violation of his rights. Then he has his spinal cord severed, and everybody waits days. There are protests, but the protests are largely peaceful. 
It isn't until it comes to a head and, and Freddie is buried and they just continue to get nothing from the city at all. No, hey, we've interviewed all of them. We placed them on administrative leave until we can figure out what's going on. We've arrested them. We're charging these guys because it had to be one of these six guys. And since we can't get anything out of them, we're basically just going to fire them all or we're going to arrest them all. And we're going to let the process work itself. And nothing like that. Just silence from them. And then a group of young high school students started to get their Irish up. And they went out to the streets. And they started confronting the police. More violent protests started to erupt. And then from those violent protests sprung more people coming into the, uh, coming into the fight and coming into the fray. And you had both groups of, uh, of militants from around the city who were frustrated and angry, and you also had these you know, community organizers or these a a anarchists who find themselves into every single fray, and then it became a big deal. Now, all of a sudden, buildings are being destroyed and set on fire. The police are coming out, and they're throwing rocks and stones and, and, and sticks and stuff at the police. And we get what we have now. And one of the things that makes me so angry is, number one, the lack of understanding of what's going on, and then also the, the, the poor reporting. I want to play for you what the mayor said when she came out, because she came out yesterday, and she is being eviscerated by the media for, for saying what I'm about to play for you. And I want you to listen closely to what she said. Roll the tape. What? We've, we've had these types of conversations before, uh, and hmm. I've made it very Side clear that I uh, worked with the police and instructed them to do everything that they could to make sure that the protesters were able to exercise their uh, right to free speech. Uh, it's a very delicate balancing act because while we uh, try to make sure that they were protected from the cars and the other you know, things that were going on, um, we also gave those who wished to destroy space to do that as well. Now, what did you hear? This is what she said. While we tried to make sure, I'm gonna, hang on, let me turn my mic down, my uh, earpiece down here. While we tried to make sure that they were protected, the protesters were protected from the cars and the other things that were going on. And I had, or she said, I'd ordered the police to give them space to uh, protest. She said, we also gave those who wished to destroy space room to do that. And she talked about the delicate balancing act. Now, this is the way the Blaze reported it. During a recent press conference, Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake confirmed that the protesters were be giving, be, being given space to, quote, destroy. And that is not at all what she said. It's not even close to what she said. It is a gross distortion of what she was saying. What she was saying was, we wanted to give people room to protest. People have a right to protest. There is a difference between protesters and rioters. And she said, we wanted to give people space to protest. And we wanted to make sure that they were protected from things like cars and a lot of the other stuff that was going on. So they had set up perimeters to allow the protesters room in order to come in and, and do what they were going to do. And she said, it's a delicate balancing act because in doing that, in protecting the legal protesters, we also gave those who wished to destroy space or wished to destroy the space to do that as well. So she was making an admission that says, listen, we were trying to give the protesters room to, to legally protest. And unfortunately, one of the byproducts of that is we also gave those who wanted room to destroy room to do that as well. She was not suggesting in any way only someone who was, who was specifically trying to, con uh, to uh, contort her words would have deduced from what she said that she said, oh, yeah, we wanted to give those who wanted to destroy the city room to destroy the city. That is utterly ridiculous. And it's shameful that it's being reported. I mean, this is what the Blaze had to say. I, I, I'm just I'm surprised the piece is still up because it's an absolute and total disgrace of journalism.
to promote it that way. And they did it just to stir up more hate and to run more headlines and to get more clicks. So shame on you, Blaze, for running a story like that. But let me get back to what I was talking about before. So you've got the riots going on now. And the police have moved in. But the police are afraid. They, they've set up these perimeters in order to kind of protect things, but they're really not protecting anything. They're just out there as a show of force. And you see the lines of them lined up in the video that I played for you earlier when the governor was speaking. And all they're doing is setting up semi-perimeters. And last night I was watching Fox News and they had one of their correspondents out who was interviewing a lot of the people on the street. And while he was there, the police were 300 or were two or 300 yards away down the street, just standing there, just standing around, just saying, hey, we're, this is where we decided we're going to put our line. And 300 feet away from that, there were literally people breaking into a liquor store and they've got film. And this guy, the, the reporter who was out there is telling him, hey, these guys are just, these guys are just pulling stuff out. They're just, they, they're just, they're robbing these guys blind. And he interviewed another business owner across the street. And he said, they didn't do anything. He's like, they came and they took everything out of my store and the cops did nothing. Only after the rioters left, did the police come in. Let me ask you something, ladies and gentlemen, what is the police's job? Hmm? The police have a responsibility. They say it's to serve and protect, but in reality, their job is to protect life and property. That's what you pay taxes for. You pay taxes so that when the rioters show up, the police show up to protect what you have, whether that's your home or your business or your car, whatever. You pay the police to show up and defend you. Yet where are they? Where were they in Ferguson? Where are they in Baltimore? They're out as a show of force. They're protecting nothing. What's amazing to me is how a small group of people of two or three hundred can literally overrun an entire police department and can leave them impotent. And the, and, and the news media would like you to believe that this is a this is a failure of leadership. Where is the leadership? Where is the leadership? But the truth is, none of these guys want to move in. None of them want to make the decision because you know what you have to respond with? You have to respond with reasonable force. Which means if you have people who are coming out and throwing rocks at you and bottles, you know what that is? That's a use of deadly force. One of those rocks could hit somebody in the face and could kill them. So guess how you have to respond? You don't get to say, well, we're going to set up a perimeter here, and you know what? We just really don't feel like it's safe for our officers to go in to protect life and property. Too bad. We say, well, we don't want to escalate the situation. Too bad. You have a job to do. Your job is to protect life and property, and you go in whether it's safe or not. You respond with reasonable force, which means if they are throwing rocks and bottles at you, you've got asps, you've got tear gas, you unleash an ungodly firestorm down upon those people until you maintain calm. You don't allow a hand, handful of 100 or 200 protesters to overrun you. You fight. Because that's what people are paying you to do. And I had this conversation a while back. I started talking with people about private security. And I said, we should really be discussing whether or not we should be using public security at all, a public police force. Why don't we use private security? Why don't we allow individuals or neighborhoods the ability to hire their own private security and reduce the massive burden, the financial and tax burden that we put on the people and give them that money back to be able to provide for their own security. And one of the email, one of the messages I got on YouTube was, well, the poor can't, can't afford security. So what would happen is the poor wouldn't get any security and the rich would be able to overrun the poor. Let me ask you something. The poor have security today? Do the poor have security in Baltimore? Does Freddie Gray have justice for what happened to him? 
Is there any sign that he's ever going to have justice? The business owners in Baltimore who had their stores looted while the police sat back comfy and cozy 300 yards away, are they getting what they're paying for? Ladies and gentlemen, the poor don't have security. They don't have safety. They don't have a police force that responds. I'm going to tell you right now, if I called the cops, they'd be there in two minutes. The neighborhood I live in, the area, I called the other night a couple of years ago. The guys uh, behind my house, I have, a, I have a lake behind my house, and the water sound carries over that lake. And for some reason, there's some young kid or, or, or guy who decided that he wanted to play his guitar every night at like 11 o'clock through the summer. And of course, we had the windows open at my house, and even when we closed the windows, it didn't stop the, the guitar music from blowing through across the lake to my property. And... Uh, and I let it go for a long time, and, and it just never stopped. It'd be midnight, the guy would still be playing, and my kids were like, Dad, we, th this music is really loud. And so I just simply called the cops and just said, Hey, I've got, I want to make a noise complaint. Guy behind me, could you just go ask him, please, to, to shut it down? I, I don't want to be a jerk. I think 10 o'clock is reasonable, but uh, you know, please don't have him blaring you know, electric guitar music at midnight. And guess what the cops did? They went over there, because guess what's right behind me? Another really nice neighborhood. You can't even get the cops to show up in some of these Baltimore neighborhoods. They can literally be looting 300 yards away, and the cops won't respond. People think they've got security now? They think the police are doing their jobs? When you need them, they're not there. They've decided they don't want to escalate the situation. And the reason is that they're afraid of making things worse. And so what they do is they give power and authority to the rioters. And what they needed to do from the beginning, from the beginning when those group of teenagers were out there, they need to be out there. And they needed to say, everyone here is free to protest, but the first guy who throws a rock is going to get his head clubbed. There needs to be an expectation of what is acceptable. And when you see somebody's business being looted, you don't stop, you don't hold back, you don't allow your police to sit on the sidelines and say, well, under normal circumstances, we would defend you, but today we've decided we're not going to. Today we've decided we're not going to show up. No. You don't get to make that choice. That's why I pay you. There is no greater example as to why, look at Ferguson. The only places in the, in the rioting areas of Ferguson that didn't get hit were who? Were the guys who showed up with their own guns outside of their own buildings and said, you come out here, you start throwing rocks, I'm going to shoot you. I guarantee you, I, I was telling Darren this before the show started, if this was going on in Kansas City, I would grab my rifle, my vest, and my riot gun, I would assemble a team, and we would go down there. And I would simply stand, if the government, if the, if the police department is not going to do their jobs, we will do it for them, and we will stand on the road as a show of force. We will defend the businesses. We will protect life and property if you're unwilling to do it. Because that's the right thing to do. And you know what? You don't have to pay me a penny. Because what these guys are doing is absolutely unacceptable. Don't get me wrong, the police, the city, the governor, they're all wrong. This should have never happened. Freddie Gray's death is an atrocity. Some people need to go to prison over what happened to Freddie Gray. And that whole city should be protesting what happened to him. But there is a difference between protests and riots. And when protests turn into riots, we have a problem. And that's when the police have a responsibility, a duty to do their job. And frankly, I don't care whether it's dangerous for you. You signed the contract. You signed up. You said, I'll go. I will serve. I will protect. Well, today's the day. Today's when you do it. You don't stand by and watch your city burn. 
Shameful. Back after this.